That's a hard room to get to stop networking, but I like that because that's what we're about. I'm Emily Chenever. I'm the CEO of the Austin Board of Realtors, also known as the Chief Bottle Washer, and most importantly, such a proud member of a team that supports you each and every day. So thank you for being here with us this morning. We're so glad to have you. Uh, happy Halloween. There are no tricks or treats today, but there will be really good conversation about what's happening in this business district. District In this area, the domain has seen explosive growth. You guys know that. You're seeing it each and every day. We want to talk about where we've come from and talk about where we're going um, and hope that that serves you well in your business with your clients. Oh, somebody's alarm. It's time to wake up, team. All right. <laughs> with us today are a group of experts that are here to help shed light on where we've been, where we're going, as I said, a little bit about what's going on right now as well. And I'm going to introduce them quickly so that you'll have the context for the comments that they'll provide. John Roberts is a principal and managing director of TIP Strategies, which is a major economic strategy firm with clients from throughout the U.S. John has been with TIP Strategies since 2000 and helped transition the company from its Texas-based practice to a national strategy firm. His portfolio includes planning work from New York to California. We prefer it right here in Texas. John, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. Our second John is John Hockenyos. <laughs> president of TXP Incorporated. He's an expert in the Central Texas economy. John founded TXP in 1987 while attending the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Hook him, John. Since then, TXP has successfully completed hundreds of projects for a wide variety of clients. He has served as a resource witness on a variety of issues in front of city council, state legislatures, and the US Congress. If you can impart wisdom on them, I know you'll do right with these people. Thanks for being here today. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. David Ruddick is the vice president of real estate for Indeed, which has their largest concentration of employees right here in the domain area. Indeed is the number one online job site worldwide with over 250 million really? unique visitors every worldwide? month. It's available in more than 50 countries in over 28 languages. David manages Indeed's real estate portfolio in 24 cities around the world. So he's uniquely positioned to understand what tech employees are looking for when they place their offices to hire and he knows how to retain the best talent. David received his MBA right here from the UT McComb School of Business and has closely watched Austin's explosive growth over the past decade. David, thanks for being here. Thank you. Last but not least is Chad Marsh. He is the managing principal of Endeavor Real Estate Group, which played a pivotal role in the development of this area. Earlier this year, Endeavor sold Domain Northside to Tier REIT, which is owned by Cousins Properties. While future development will be overseen by Cousins, Chad was the co-developer of the domain. He is so uniquely qualified to share this perspective about the history of the, of the development of this area and will be an, an amazing contributor to our conversation this morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks. So we'll start with a look back, which means we go to Chad because he was here in the beginning. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how we got where we were. What's, what's the quick overview on the history of the domain? It's a, it's a long uh, overview, but I'll try to condense it to a couple minutes. Uh, as many of you know, this was the old IBM campus. It was a roughly two and a quarter million square foot manufacturing and office campus. Uh, office, I say that um, with a little bit of uh, facetiousness. I mean, it was a legitimate office, but there were no windows in the buildings. <laughs> and uh, for when we bought this in 1999 with uh, Blackstone and J.E. Roberts, uh, for a while, we tried to relet some of these buildings, and, and we'd walk. There was one building that was um, 500 feet deep by 500 feet wide, and it had 10 by 10 offices all the way up and down the different rows. And it was it was like a, you know, you put put a piece of cheese in there and try to get a, a rat to go find it. It was that much of a maze, and so we struggled uh, to lease those buildings for a while. And we, over time, uh, redid repurposed two of the buildings, that, which are now. Uh, truly creative office buildings. Everybody uses that term pretty loosely now, but truly creative office buildings. Over time, uh, the rest of the, the buildings got torn down. Uh, but the, the kind of the big picture, um, in 2002, 2003, uh, we went to our partners and had an idea to do a lifestyle center, which is now the, the Neiman Marcus Macy's phase, the first phase that really was the catalyst for what is the, the rest of the domain. 
uh, and they said, look, we don't want to do vertical development if you guys um, want to try to put a partnership, you know, raise some money on your own and, and put the deal together, go for it. And so we did. We got Macy's, we got Neiman Marcus, and we were kind of off and running. Uh, partway through that, we joined with Simon, who's many of you know is the biggest mall owner in the world. I think the biggest, if not the biggest, one of the very biggest. Did that phase. Um, we sold off some land to Simon to do their second phase, which is the Dillard's and Dick's phase. And then we went out and raised more money uh, from Deutsche Bank to buy what is now Northside and all these tall office buildings you see off uh, uh, not too far from here. Uh, and we, uh, we timed it pretty badly. Uh, we, we were spending lots of money on plans, tearing down buildings, putting in roads, and then the tech wreck, excuse me, the financial wreck happened. The tech wreck was 01. Uh, the financial wreck happened in, in 08, and we had to put everything, on, put the brakes on. We had a, a signed lease with Nordstrom, we had a signed lease with Whole Foods, and we had a signed letter of intent, almost a signed finalized deal with Saks. And that was going to be the impetus for what uh, is this phase here. And we and they all kind of looked at the world and said, this doesn't make any sense. We've got to just tear up these leases and just shut it down, and, and we did. Uh, and, and when the world started to kind of come out of the, out of, out of the funk, uh, 2010, 2011, at that point, Saks had already decided they were going to move out of the market, um, and they ended up closing their store down in the Arboretum shortly thereafter. Nordstrom kind of said, yeah, maybe, and, and Whole Foods said, yes, we definitely want to do it. But the crazy office tower that you were going to build above the Whole Foods at that time was what we had designed. We don't want that. And we said, OK, <laughs> because we wanted to get Whole Foods, and we wanted to get the project going again. Uh, so 2011 came around, still a lot of people were fearful. Um, we got, uh, got commitments to do the Whole Foods deal. Uh, didn't have Nordstrom at that time, and then got commitments to do an office building uh, and kind of get the whole momentum, and, and one apartment building, excuse me, get the, get the project going again. And so it got going again in earnest in 2011. The, the construction completed in 2013, and then this phase here that you're sitting in uh, open in 2016. So for the last eight or nine years, it's been nonstop. Um, we always thought it would take about 20 years to get to this place. We just thought it would go like this instead of, you know, like that, and then and just kind of <laughs> rocket ship up. And so the, the overall 20-year timeline was generally about right. Um, the way it happened was, was very wrong. I, I guess you're <laughs> suggesting that there's volatility in real estate, which I'm sure none of these people have experienced in their business day to day. <laughs> Um, but sometimes that's how it goes, and it, it looks like you landed on top. Uh, I, I love that you called it a lifestyle center. It's become a lifestyle for me, at least, and I think that's true for many of us across Central Texas. So you talked about some of the players. You talked about kind of how that came about. Where do you feel like it's going as you kind of close that chapter for yourself and for Endeavor? What, what do you see coming up? Well, uh, there's still some sites to, to develop here at the domain. Uh, the biggest one is just, you guys might have, parked in the Nordstrom garage just south of Nordstrom. Further south of that, there's a five acre uh, surface parking lot that, that wants to be something more than that and, and will be uh, with time. Uh, Cousins owns that site. Um, uh, there's some preliminary planning that's happened there. There's no, no plans ready to be unveiled or no, no definitive direction as to what it will be has, has been uh, settled upon. But I think over time, you'll see a, a nice mini development in there. Uh, but I, I think over time, uh, there's still a couple more office sites to, to, to build. One, uh, hopefully, will get going in about uh, three or four weeks, um, just about 100 yards east of here. Uh, and then where Indeed is at the south end of, of the overall domain, um, that owner, Stone Lake, has some, some plans to do a couple more office buildings and an apartment uh, building or two there. I think long term, um, I think you'll probably see a garage or two get torn down yeah. here, and then something vertical get uh, put in its place particularly if everybody's prognostication that we uh, go to more driverless car system, which have, hasn't really happened yet, but I think most people think it's coming. I don't know if anybody can predict when it will be, um, but I believe over time you'll see a garage or two get torn down mm -hmm. and, and something, uh, uh, you know, office, uh, hotel, uh, apartments, or, or some version, some combination <coughs> thereof will get Built. Yeah, John, you want to tap on? Yeah, I just wanted to, to give you just a little more historical context because I've sadly I've been working with the city of Austin longer than it's healthy. You know, I hate to <laughs> hate to admit that. But There's you a all for that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you all probably remember there was controversy around the city's tax incentive program associated with this development. And 
the conversation at the city at the time, which I was part of, was two things. One, Chad mentioned this, this was zoned for office. There was no demand for office in 1999. I mean, we looked at that and said the build out of that, if we leave it under that current zoning structure, is gonna stretch into decades. The second thing going on was that there was development going on not too far up the road, up in the Williamson County area, there were some major sort of lifestyle kinds of centers being built, and there was a tremendous amount of retail leakage about to happen. And so when you put those two things together, we're not gonna get much ad valorem tax as a city because we're not gonna see a lot of development and we're gonna leak a bunch of sales tax up to the north, we better try this. And then the third thing was, this was at the time when urbanism, new urbanism, mixed use, light, you know, whatever you wanna call it, was not just what the market demanded, it was kind of a new idea as opposed to these discrete land uses. And so that's where the whole thing came about. And what's interesting about it is people still rail about it, but there was a lot of conscious thought that went into doing that. It would be hard to argue it's been anything other than massively successful. People do argue that all the time, but that's the, the thinking. Now that doesn't mean that would go on forever. And that was also a concern, was the city manager looked at me and said, if we incentivize this deal, does that mean every deal forever and ever gets the same incentives? And the answer is no, because the external environment changes, as it has. You don't need to incentivize mixed use development anymore. That's what the market demands. That's what the market wants. So there was, I guess, the point being some thought around all that, and I'm sure, you know, that probably had some positive impact. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I think that's so indicative of, you know, how Austin has struggled in the past to face hard challenges, is that we come at them with fear quite often. And what happens is we are sometimes reactive to the very loud fussies. Yes. Uh, even when there is great strategic thought in, in the momentum behind a project or in the decisions made behind a project. And I think we'll continue to see that in Austin. The important thing for you guys as uh, practitioners on the ground is to be sure that you're engaging your client in thoughtful conversation that is not reactively based in fear because that information is there. You've just sort of got to get through the noise to get to that, that nugget of truth so that you can inform your clients of what's to come. Right. Um, I, in preparation of this, I actually did something that I've been meaning to do for quite a while, and that was to get onto TCAD and look at the cool. assessed value for the domain. Uh, before the first phase got built, uh, which it opened in March of 2007, the assessed value, if my memory is correct, for the entire domain site was roughly $100 million. There was $25 million in incentives for that first phase, Neiman Marcus to Macy's, and, and believe me, I believe it is worthy of debate whether you should um, you know, provide tax incentives or not. I can tell you, I do not think you'd have today what you have without those tax incentives. It was the catalyst. So I looked up on TCAD, and I just looked at the real property assessed values. I didn't look at personal property, what you got, furniture and fixtures and things like that within any individual building and it was $2.75 billion, and it does not include full assessment for buildings that are being built now. It, doesn't, it certainly doesn't include any assessment for future buildings. I don't know what the, the eventual number is. It probably looks something like $4 billion uh, in, in a few years, would be my guess. So from a $100 million tax base to a $4 billion tax base in you know, 16, 17 years, plus or minus, um, is pretty amazing growth. Yeah, uh, we looked between, and, and, oh, and, excuse me, go ahead. And, and, I, don't, and I don't think, um, David certainly can speak to it. I'm not sure if the Indeeds and the Amazons and, and the Facebooks, others, um, Verbos that are here, I'm not sure they would have come here but for the mixed use development that this is. And David might have a different take, but I'm sure some of those folks chose this because of the, the amenities. Sure, yeah, absolutely. John, we're going to head to you. I want to mention that we looked at the MLS data with regards to what's happened residentially in this area and saw a very similar pattern, that the price per square foot has nearly doubled between 2011 to now, that there was $50 million more business over year <laughs> as we continued to see that growth. So certainly you guys are experiencing that as you're serving clients. John, how, how do you assess the overall economic impact of the area? What has it done? How does it reverberate out? So you're going to ask me another question later on about the tech impact, and I'm going to, just do that. I'm going to uh, answer both of those in the same way. I think that uh, what we see nationally right now is that if the, if the companies that uh, are choosing to relocate or expand uh, aren't able to attract the tech worker, whether they call themselves a tech company or not, they're not going to be successful. 
So I'm interested to hear what Dave has to say about that as well, because that is the common denominator on economic impact. And the other element to this that I think we all know, but it's worth talking about again, is just the, how fierce the competition for talent has become. And uh, I was on the phone this morning with some folks in Wisconsin, and the, uh, what they don't realize is that this is, uh, this is truly a national competition, and it's a zero-sum game. And we need to realize it's a zero-sum game. We, we gain at the expense of others. Yep. And, uh, and that's something that in the economic development world, in the real estate world, it's, it's, it's one thing to say it, it's another to realize it. And so this, uh, this talent hunt has increasingly come down to the fact that, and this isn't totally accurate, but uh, if it used to be about the jobs that you provided and that was enough, uh, that dynamic has shifted. It's not enough to create the job, never mind the fact that we're national unemployment rate is somewhere south of 4%. So aside from all of that, uh, what that means is that the forces that would correct it uh, are not, we're not going to see them in the short term. And I think this has huge real estate implications. And what I mean is that the um, uh, retirement of the baby boom generation, uh, there's nothing is going to change that. We could push the retirement age up, but it wouldn't have a dramatic, first of all, we couldn't do it. Uh, and secondly, it, it would, uh, would only give us a couple years. Um, the other is that uh, our uh, fertility rates are down and we're postponing when we have children. And if we all wanted to instantly correct this and we were really amorous and we went home and did something <laughs> about it, 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 that's an 18 year solution if we were successful. John, so I really didn't expect us to run down that rabbit trail today. <laughs> well, you know, when you talk about demographics, you have to. And, uh, and then the third, uh, and th this is not a laughing matter, but it has the same sort of uh, long time frame attached to it, is immigration. That's the other way you solve the talent problem. Yep. And we're not, not only are we uh, affecting immigration at lower wage rates, we're affecting it um, in for B visas, in, in other words, in higher skill. Mm -hmm. And so will that continue after 2020? We don't know. We don't know. And the dynamic has changed. So what this has to do with your question about uh, really the economic impact is that if you're not at the forefront of recruiting and attracting talent, uh, there's no economic future for you. It's that, I, I hate to be that blunt. Am I overstating it, Joan? No. Yeah, an important message for our legislators, yeah? yeah. Who don't seem to yeah. uh, make the connection, not between what you do tonight, but yeah. it being <laughs> Halloween too. <laughs> Realtors should help them make that connection. Um, let me first, before I continue the conversation, remind you guys or tell you that you are welcome to text Austin Realtors to 22333. You can text in questions and we'll take those as time permits at the end of our conversation. Um, John, before we hop over to David, you talked about this being a zero sum game. What does the game look like when the players are downtown Austin versus North Austin? How competitive is that matter? Yeah, so that, that actually did a little bit, hard to believe, a little bit of research on this. But, um, but the center of gravity, if you took everyone in Austin and weighted them the same, where would our center be? And uh, n not a surprise to you, it's been steadily moving north. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and while our overall educational attainment uh, continues to rise in the city of Austin, I have these numbers if you're interested in, uh, the, the northern part of Austin uh, still uh, has a higher percentage. Mm -hmm. And so the, I think the impact on that is going to be fairly significant. And then when you look at the real estate play, and I, I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers, but th this is worth just maybe spending a moment on. Since 2010, in other words, the last nine years or so, of the um, 58 of the 89 uh, Silicon Valley in San Francisco Bay Area tech companies that have expanded outside of Silicon Valley, um, Austin leads the nation in uh, absorption of, of the expansion of tech companies out of California. And, and they're ahead of Boston and Seattle and everyone else. Now, it's worth noting that um, growth in Silicon Valley is continuing. And they're actually absorbing even more than we are. But we, we're now at the head of the pack for everyone, for every expansion of a tech company out of Silicon Valley. And that's a very big deal. Yeah, so uh, let's talk to one, and then I'm going to come to you, John Hawkins. Uh So David, you, you're the tech company that we won. 
which is lovely. Welcome to Austin. Tell us a little bit about how you made that decision. You know, what, is, what has it been like now that you're here? What are your employees saying? And really what went into the decision making around locating such a heavy force here? Yeah, so we're actually, um, we're homegrown. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows that. Oh, well, that's um, true. Indeed was founded at the very end of 2004. I came on in 2009 um, as I was finishing business school and we're literally located in an office up on Anderson Lane above the Chase Bank building, maybe 30 of us here and about 50 in Stamford. Um, and uh, it's been pretty remarkable to see the growth of Indeed and then Austin at the, at the same time. And um, we, uh, because our, our founder was based up in, in the Northwest, that's generally where we wanted to stay. And so we continue to grow there. We took on more office in, in Mopac and then another um, location on 360, uh, and then again um, up in, in Champions Grandview Way on 22, 22 and 360. So we've traditionally always been, uh, had a sort of a, a preference to be located up in the north. We also took a downtown office a few years ago. Um, and when we started to think longer term about where the employee growth would be, for us to just ship everyone and move everyone south, it just didn't make sense given how many employees now we had that were living up north, and so the domain became a perfect location for us for the proximity to uh, where the employees are. And then I think added to that, many of the things we talked about, just the amenities of the domain, um, the housing, accommodation, transportation, um, retail, everything about it really allows employees to sort of have a one-stop shop of access, and then also being more um, comfortable commuting to where they live um, and has worked out very well for us, and that's why we um, have recently continued to expand. We also took um, another location, Domain Gateway, nearby, so this has really become our center of gravity. And it's interesting, um, you know, Chad was talking about mixed-use development. Back in business school, I uh, did a study on mixed-use development, and back then it really was a theoretical exercise, mm -hmm. um, and we try to value um, you know what would what's the what would the value of a mixed use development be versus each individual property you know whether it was the retail component or the the housing and we actually looked at Mueller back then and this was a pretty bad time it was 2009 um, but it was it was hard for us to actually uh, value the the impact of mis mixed use development it, the numbers really didn't necessarily show that mixed use was adding that much value and I think it's really incredible now ten years on to see the domain. I, I don't think I've seen um, as, as successful mixed-use development as this, and um, we see it uh, from our employees because this is our headquarters, so we have employees globally now that come to uh, Austin for uh, whether it's leadership meetings or trainings, and often they have off-sites and they stay at the hotels, and it's just so convenient to mm -hmm. be in a location that really caters to everyone, um, whether they're living here permanently or, or more transient. So. Um, for us, in general, it's been a big success. Yeah, John Hockenius, I know you want to tack on. Yeah, so there's an elephant in this room in this whole equation. Anybody want to take a guess what it is? I'll give you a hint. It starts with a T and ends with a C. It's traffic. Traffic is the killer in this region, right? And let's let's be honest. We aren't going to build significant more roadways. You know, we have a legislature dead set against additional tollways. Rail is a 20th century dream that's never gonna happen because it costs all the money in the world and doesn't work very well. Autonomous vehicles are coming, but they will be coming on the existing grid system that we have. There's a lot of work actually happening on that. Austin is in the running for becoming a proving ground actually for part of that. The best estimates I have seen are that you might, under a truly 100% autonomous system, you might be able to put double the number of cars on the existing roadway system that we have today. So what does that mean for this whole conversation? What it means is that historically, we used to tell people, concentrate centers of gravity in downtown. Well, that works great in a town of 200,000 people. A town of 2 million people, it doesn't work so well. The domain is now a second downtown. Mm -hmm. They're going to be more. This is not going to be the end. I mean, we were already talking about the domain on Riverside. That's really essentially an extension of downtown. There will be new activity that develops to the east. The west, to some degree, is a function of environmental concerns. That I'm not so sure of. But the only way we're going to function is kind of what David alluded to, which is you can't make me drive 40 minutes to get to work. And particularly when one accident on Mopac in 40 minutes turns into an hour and 40 minutes, right? 
So what we are going to see is more and more of these concentrated clusters that mix where you work, where you live, where you recreate, whether you shop, all these things. And the domain really is for us, in many ways, the pilot project. It's a giant, incredibly successful pilot project, but it's a pilot project to show that the center of gravity doesn't necessarily have to be downtown, and that you can have multiple centers of gravity as the region expands. And so, that's and I'll shut up, but that's particularly important when you're talking about employers, because as an employer, I think people are coming, and I think it's not just Indeed that's doing this, people are saying, I have different demographics that work for me. I have 20-somethings who want to live right in the heart of the central city. I have 30-somethings who have young kids who really want a single family home and be a little bit closer to schools. I have 40-somethings who maybe want to downsize or 50-somethings. Let's locate employment in different areas of this region that allows each of those demographics that work for me to be in proximity to the kind of housing and other amenities that they care about. You can't shut up just yet, because I want to follow up on All that. Right. I think that's an interesting case study for a conversation we're having in this city at large, given what's potentially coming with an overhaul of a land use code. Yeah. We weren't going to go here today, but you just primed it perfectly. Well, so, yeah. You know, when you're talking about centers of, of significant and substantive change, yeah. I, I want to go back to what we talked about earlier with Chad of these were horrible buildings with no windows, parking lots and grass and now we are where we are today and that transition is uncomfortable you can file that on the file that says change is hard mm -hmm. and we especially feel that here in Austin Texas where we embrace our culture and our character so closely how what lessons do we learn from the way that this transition has happened from the experience of the reverberation outside of the domain itself how has this community grown to accommodate becoming this new center and this new hub um, it's the, the lessons we've learned is that our politics and our actual patterns of growth aren't aligned particularly well. And we used to laugh, we'd say we call them the Central City Mafia, you'd say but a bunch of people who live within a mile radius of the capital control the political conversation in Austin, Texas. And that is less true with districts, but still somewhat true. And there is, there is a, and I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anybody, Austin was always perfect the day you moved here, right? You know, I mean, that's the old joke. I, mean, I had a neighbor who told me it was perfect, I should have been here before World War II. That's when it was really great. And so there is always this temptation to say, I want to go back to the way it was, I want things not to change, oh my God, how can Hutz Hamburger shut down, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but in fact, in any kind of an ecosystem, whether it's a biological ecosystem or an economic ecosystem, if you're not changing, you're stagnating. If you're stagnating, you're dying. Our politics aren't lined up with that at this point. And then the second piece, I'll go back to it again, we cannot pay for the infrastructure required to accommodate this growth if we are going to continue to do business as usual. We can't build enough roads. We can't build enough transit. We just flat don't have enough money. And we won't politically tolerate raising enough money. So we're going to have to get that message out, and we're going to have to get comfortable with the idea that we've got the footprint we've got. How do we accommodate growth within that footprint? Love it. Now you guys keep clapping when we come talking to you about that code because it's going to be uncomfortable. But that point is an important one. If that change is coming, we have to work through it together as a community and look, talk about what our future looks like. David, as one of the companies that's driving that change, you know, such a large employer here, talk to me a little bit about it. it I understand that it, make, it made sense for you given your, the location of many of your existing employees to continue to expand here, but how have you leveraged the community? How have you leveraged that environment of work, live, play, all in one spot? And what does that mean for you as a business in serving your employees? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, as, as John was talking, I was thinking our biggest number, our biggest challenge uh, in terms of our biggest real estate challenge as a business is for sure um, transportation. We, we just can't ever get enough parking and, uh, you know, a lot of people, especially in, in Austin, are just used to driving cars in on their own without necessarily carpooling. And we've invested a lot in thinking about, you know, ride sharing schemes, um, subsidies to use public transport, um, having shuttle buses to and from our, our locations uh, to different areas of Austin, but that is just the constant challenge we face. And I think our hope is um, that by 
investing in the domain and bringing more employees here, that will start to get easier because of the mix mm -hmm. um, of use that it has, um, particularly the residential. So especially when looking to attract maybe a younger democratic, demographic people that a lot of the people we hire, um, also to John's point, you have a lot of these big Silicon Valley firms moving to Austin. They locate people to Austin. When they're new to Austin, our hope too is that with the domain and our office here, they can also have a variety of choice, choices with respect to accommodation. That means they can walk to work. They don't have to drive into work. And so I think that mixed use is, is really what's key for us in hoping that more and more people will choose to ideally even live in the domain because that just eases our burden with respect to transportation um, and parking we have to provide or, or other travel incentives. Um, and I think getting more people to live close to, to where their work is really critical to that because it, as everyone knows, it, I'd, I'd be sort of a, um, uh, a broken record if I, if I said this, but you know, I remember when I first came to Austin, <laughs> the traffic, the time it took me to travel from X to Y was probably a third and, and it's just gonna get worse. And so um, having uh, thought around locating people based on the most efficient transportation is really critical. And I think for us too, what we'd love to see more in domain, I know there is talk of the city, but just there is transportation there, which is great, but there could be a lot more they could invest more in, in the bus services. They could hopefully further extend out the light rail. And I think that will only help um, employees, employers like us um, uh, want to invest more here. Yeah, that, uh, that leads up maybe to a question from the audience, and any of you can take this, whoever feels fit. The, do you know, to what extent does the domain plan or already have existing partnerships with Cap Metro that ensure that we leverage our existing transit, even if we're not adequately preparing for our future just yet? We, we've, uh, it's unfortunate that the, uh, the Kramer Lane stop is a so-called kiss and ride stop. I mean, there's, there's no parking. It's, uh, you'd get off there. It's, it's a little further away than we'd like it to be. Um, sorry, that sounded bad. Womp, womp. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's, it's about a half a mile from, from the stop to here, and so that's just too far for people to walk. There's some people that uh, put their bike on the, on the train. Uh, hop off the train, ride their bike in, but that's it's not moving the needle. It's not a lot. Uh, we had talked to uh, Cap Metro to actually have the site about where the Top Golf site is today, and I think eventually it will get moved further north. Um, but there is a circulator bus. However, that circulator bus right now goes to the JJ Pickle campus, which doesn't have a lot of density. And by the time you circulate through the JJ Pickle campus and come into the domain, it takes too much time. So there is not a good um, last mile solution right now at Cap Metro. Uh, is working on it. I believe it will happen. It won't happen overnight, but that would be a big component. Uh, there's no silver bullet to solve the, the, the transportation uh, problem, but uh, dense mixed-use developments like this, uh, a good circulator system from the from the Cap Metro stop, uh, you know, more people riding their bikes. You know, just uh, you, you throw three or four things at it, and you can you can put a dent into it. Uh, but we do have a, a population growth that's that's, that's you know, working against those efficiencies that we need to you know, kind of meld into the system. But, yeah. uh, it, it will, eventually you will have a better circulator system from probably a better stop on the, on the, on the red line, but it's, it's not there today. Okay, um, maybe for either John, I've got a question related to the type of housing in the domain. Most of it is rental, which is great. Those will be future home buyers one day, right team? Um, but what, what should we expect in terms of owned ownership, owned property here in the domain? Should we see, are we going to see more condos? What's happening to the single family around the domain? Do you want to, want to answer or do you want me to? Well, I, I have no idea. Uh, but I, I but would just like you to make I, it up at this but, point. Well, <laughs> We're good at that. Yeah, I'm good at making things up. But, um, but maybe more valuable would be to look at the trends that are happening elsewhere. Sure. And, and one of the trends that we're seeing is this huge resistance uh, toward multifamily in so many of the non-urban communities and some of the urban communities we're working in. And, and that, that's not making it up. That is the way um, a lot of those communities have decided they, they're opposed to density and they're opposed to sprawl. And the net effect of that is that they're not allowing uh, for any options for the very demographic they're trying to attract. So that's worked to Austin's advantage. So I would think that the market would probably continue to respond to that. And I'd like Chad's thought on that. Because 
because those who are leaving, as I said, I was on the phone with uh, folks in Racine, Wisconsin this morning, but it's literally everywhere that we've been in the last year, this resistance to it. So if you have that product here and you have a demand for it, it would seem to me logical that you would be able to put more uh, uh, condos and rental units on the market and have those taken than you would anywhere else, and it may be at any other time. Chad, do you? Well, it, it, I think there's more rental units coming. I don't know if there will be a condo project or not. Um, if there is, it won't, it won't be much. Maybe it's one, one project. There was one project back in 2009, Novare, who did a project down, a couple projects downtown, was going to do a high-rise condo project. Well, the world fell apart, uh, so that didn't happen. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, it'd be nice if we had some, some, some four, uh, some, some owner, uh, some ownership uh, here as it relates to residential versus, uh, uh, versus for rent. Uh, but I, I don't see it happening much, at least within the confines of the domain. Mm. Um, but I do see some more multifamily for rent projects coming, uh, but just not a lot more the condos. My, my sense though is that those renters become owners one day. Yeah. And that what there is definitely the case for is that reverberation in the in Northwest Austin and Great Hills and uh, as you head towards Cedar Park, that, that reverberating population is centered here now. They're gonna wanna stay north and you get prepared to move them up when, when appropriate. John. So there's, there's two things going on. One is, let's not forget that a lot of the people who work at the domain don't make eighty, ninety, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 a year. They're making relatively small amounts of money and you desperately need them because mm -hmm. they gotta wait tables and work at the retail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that really is a big push around the rental side. And that's a big challenge because the cost of occupancy at the domain is rising rapidly and it is becoming a very big challenge for people who are doing things like running restaurants, particularly if you're not a high price point restaurant. And you should point out, John, that you're one of those. Uh, not in the domain, thank you very much, <laughs> but not too far away. Um, having said that, the other thing is, is that my experience with institutional money is it's not particularly creative. So everybody looks up and goes, wow, tons of job growth in Austin, lots of millennials, tech company, they like rental housing, let's build rental housing, great, boom, that's X percent of our portfolio. There's a, obviously a market here for high-end owner-occupied condo project. I mean, they're, they're, you, well, the first guy in is gonna do really, really well here, but you gotta finance it. And you gotta find the capital, you gotta put the financing structure together, and much of what we've seen has been external institutional capital following trends here, and you could certainly jump on that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you'll look uh, 10, 15 years from now, you, you'll look at the domain and say they should have been more dense, they should have done more, and, and that will probably be more obvious with time. Right now, uh, as John mentioned, uh, the domain is, is a very cost-effective uh, means for businesses and for people to live here relative to downtown. It's, it's not cheap in the grand scheme of Austin, don't get me wrong, but to, to, to rent an apartment downtown is about $2 per square foot. Right. Uh, to rent an apartment downtown is, is north of $3 per square foot. Uh, office space here is roughly $50 per square foot gross. Downtown, if you include parking, is about $80 gross. So right. this, is, this is an area that's at, at you know, 60 to 65% of the cost of downtown. Now it's 30, 40% more expensive than um, you know, a, a walk-up project in, in Round Rock. Um, but, but from a dense urban uh, standpoint, uh, it, is, it is very cost effective. To, to build condo level um, quality construction, which is concrete, you've got to get rents or sale prices that are 30, 40% higher than has ever been achieved in Austin. So therefore, it's going to be hard to attract that capital mm. at this time. Now, over time, as those $2 rents become 250, 260, 270, whatever the number is, um, you know, th th there'll probably be a push to say, hey, we should have some condo projects here, some ownership. Now, at that point, there's not a lot of land left <laughs> at the domain. Maybe you're, maybe you're a block away from the domain. Maybe it's one of the garages that I mentioned that gets torn down right. and something gets built back up. So you'll see a little bit of that. It will take time. Yeah. And, That's right. and, and uh, you know, I, I just want to add one more thing as it relates to kind of the uh, traffic patterns uh, where big companies um, have located. You, you got the four biggest employers at the domain are Indeed, Amazon, about to be Facebook, they'll move in in a few months, and, and, and Verbo. And, and each has had, not, well, there's different strategies. Verbo and, and, uh, and, and Indeed have, and, and Facebook have had a downtown kind of domain strategy, kind of a two-pronged strategy. Now, 
uh, Verbo actually got rid of their downtown location. They still have one at, at Fenfield South. And so they said to their employees, we're going to let you uh, office north or south. I assume the Indeed employees have a choice. I don't know how exact, exactly how it works, but they've got three or four different nodes of their business around town. Amazon, interestingly, um, when they came to town and decided they were going to plant a flag here, they looked at some suburban projects and quickly said, no, we're either going to the domain or downtown. It was it was binary. It was not. There was nobody could have thrown a cheap enough rent deal at them to go to Round Rock or Georgetown or Lear Park, see or pick your pick your spot. It just wasn't going to happen. So, thankfully for us uh, involved in the domain, they chose the domain. Had they chosen downtown, that's 2,500 more employees that are downtown. Mostly they're probably living north, and it's just more people on the road. So this is a good way to capture a lot of that traffic that otherwise is going downtown. And as right. bad as the traffic is today. It'd be a lot worse if there weren't a domain, and there needs to be, as John said, more domain-like developments to, to create different nodes where people can live, work, and play, and stay off the roads. At the end of the day, this project is successful. If everybody that comes here goes here for two reasons. So all of you guys go shopping after this. But if you come here and drive your car and you do two things while you're at the domain, that's success. If you're driving here and just doing one thing, we haven't done a very good job. Good we, need, we need people to have two reasons to be here Otherwise, they're making two trips to do the two things they're doing. It's just more people on the road. Good. So, I tend to agree with Hawking. So the first gal to build her condo here is going to be successful, and from there it'll grow. Right. But uh, David, let me turn back to you. If those condos were built, what's your sense about your employee base? Are they more? Are, are they on a more home ownership, owner occupied scale now? Are they traditionally renters? What are you seeing in terms of those who live in and around the domain? Yeah, I think at least. I guess what we've seen to date would suggest that renting would, would um, be the, the preference. Um, I think, as I said, with a lot of um, new employees coming from locations outside of Austin, they might not be ready to, to purchase right away. Um, so so my, my gut, at least, would be that renting would be the preference. And that's not to say that as um, our employee base um, evolves and we, we grow further, um, more and more people would be amenable to, to buying condos in the domain. Certainly we've seen that um, downtown whereby more and more people, and this is more anecdotal, um, I don't have specific stats, but um, I hear of more and more people buying condos downtown. So with that, I'd assume that uh, the domain would be, uh, there would be a similar appetite for the domain in the future. But I'd say right now at least it does seem that most people that would live here would probably be more uh, amenable to renting, um, and then maybe as they sort of grow their families, look to <laughs> buy a house close by. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, one of the things that we think about when we talk about Central Austin or Old Austin is we talk about the character of that community and its culture. But the truth is there is culture inherent in even new developments, and the culture here is being built by employers like Indeed and Ver Verbo. I hate that. It used to be home away. <laughs> um, indeed, um, you know, Facebook, those guys are and gals are building cultures that make this a place that is unique and has character as well. So, David, what do you feel like Indeed adds to the plate in terms of what the vibe is here and what people expect when they live, work, and play? Yeah, so I think um, we uh, attract. Uh, we attract a fairly uh, young demographic of, of tech workers and uh, I'd say we're also, um, we're certainly as a business putting a lot more focus on, on diversity. I think for um, us to grow and ultimately be the best product out there for job search, represent job seekers of all backgrounds, we have to likewise employ uh, people of all backgrounds and um, we're investing a lot there. And I think that itself, adding a, a vibrant, diverse culture um, to the domain, I think is, is very positive. Um, on the whole, and uh, you know, I think just our, ca the character of our, our business and, and our sort of motto as a business, uh, our mission is to help people get jobs, and, and that's one thing that we really um, instill in everyone. So we're very much a community-focused organization, very much purpose-driven, and, and my hope is that the employees that we attract and retain have that same that mindset, and, and they bring that culture too of community and um, helping people um, to the domain. 
Right, great. Um, just want to send you one more reminder that if you've got a couple more questions, we probably have time for them. Um, let me go back to Chad and just say that, you know, as we're nearing the end of our conversation, still taking a couple of questions, you talked about what you think might be happening in the future. What's that takeaway for a room full of practitioners that are on the floor every day with consumers that want to know what's happening here? What's the soccer stadium going to mean for them? What, what's the what, what next takeaway? Well, you know, I, I don't you know, address and further a little bit what David said as far as the culture. I think the culture, uh, the, the, the soul, the vibrancy, the energy, whatever it is of the domain and the area around the domain is still evolving. And, and I think that it will over time take on a culture that, that's easier to define than it is today. I think, um, you know, soccer stadium is, is, is more growth. There's a lot of projects that have been announced on the east side of Burnett Road that, that I believe over time will happen. They won't quite happen as quickly as you might think when you see a rendering in a, in a, in a, a newspaper article. But as, as far as, it's, it's hard to inject culture and soul and grit into a new project. And we tried, and I think we did a pretty decent job as it relates to Rock Rose, where we've got, uh, it, it, throughout Rock Rose, that our entertainment district here, and even into this area, we have 40 local bars, restaurants, and shops. And for all of those, very entrepreneurial, very creative folks, we said, look, we're not gonna build the storefront. You guys just, we're gonna, we're gonna build a shell, and instead of us formulaically saying what it's gotta look like, you guys do what you wanna do. And so it, it, it allows them to be creative and allows to something uh, to get built at one time, it looks more organic than if you just formulaically develop it as, as a typical developer might do it. Mm -hmm. And so those folks are more creative than we are, they're, they're, they're very talented, and they created a cool little district. Uh, and that's the start of, of creating that, that, that culture and that soul. And so that will hopefully um, permeate out into other developments that happen. And, and hopefully they'll, they'll be thoughtfully done. But what the, the culture and, the, and, the, and, and how do you define this area over time, I think it will evolve. It's certainly very tech heavy, um, but it's also very entertainment heavy. And, and you know, it, you, I can tell you what South Congress is. I can tell you what East Austin is. Domain is still kind of you know, a work in process. Yeah. John Hockenyos, what's your takeaway? What do these guys need to know on the ground every day? It's a tension in this world that we live in in Austin is that we venerate and value what makes us unique and different. And yet, as we get into a bigger and bigger and bigger city, it's harder and harder to hang on to. Hang on to. And he's got a tension. Rock Rose is a very creative solution, but he's got pressure to bring in national credit tenants, right? Well, national credit tenants, by definition, aren't funky, aren't weird, aren't cool. <laughs> no offense, no offense, Nordstrom. Um, and so, at the end of the day, I think maintaining that balance and maintaining the, that tension is going to be tough. Right now, we're the value proposition in the tech world. We are miles cheaper than Silicon Valley. We are miles cheaper than Boston. We are somewhat cheaper than other parts, and people think that we are the value proposition in the United States. I don't know if that is sustainable long term. Uh, and again, a lot of it is going to be about how we evolve in terms of the footprint of our city. If we get to the point where it turns into a giant sprawling megapolis and getting around is hard and all that, we're going to lose a lot of that advantage. And so I think we have to be thoughtful about that as we think about things like the land development code and transportation and all that, because that really sets the framework for kind of where we're going to go over the next 10, 15, 20 odd years. Great. David, what do you think? Culture specifically? Yeah. I mean, well, I, or, or for realtors, what should realtors be thinking? You know, they're, they're placing the employees that you guys are attracting to Austin by way of both your website and as a large employer. <laughs> When they're on the ground with one of those consumers trying to sell Austin or sell the domain, what should they be thinking about this area and how should they talk about it? Yeah, I think um, just on, on the culture piece and, and what Chad was saying, um, I thought it was an interesting point that you know the east side is defined, South Congress is defined, and I think one of the challenges for domain there is those, those um, neighborhoods have sort of history and I think that history creates a culture that's very unique and so I think as great as mixed-use development is, one thing that's really hard to do is, is mimic that because you're ultimately creating something that's brand new and you're always going to need time for culture organically to evolve and, and find its way uh, to define itself however 
It is, and I think that's, that's only one of the, the challenges for domain. But I think as far as realtors are concerned, um, I think just focusing on, um, for me, I really do think it's, it's the convenience of the domain in terms of what it brings by having everything together and just ultimately making things easier for people that live, work, and play here. Um, I, I think that's, that's the key. And I think as far as the culture is concerned, I think so far the, um, the domain has grown up very well and it is a very cool, vibrant place where, and I see it of people that come here, especially from other offices, have a great time here. I think thought needs to still continue with respect to the types of tenants that come and how growth um, continues because I think as soon as um, maybe that goes away and sprawling happens, I think we could very quickly lose that sense of dy dynamism here and, and the cool factor. And I think that itself will start to make um, potential consumers of, of real estate, whether it's buying condos or, or renting, that could turn them away and, and, want that and make them go elsewhere. So I think the thoughtfulness and consideration to continuing the growth in the right way and really being very conscious of not ruining the, the culture that seems to be blossoming well here would be my uh, advice. Got it. John Roberts, what, what do you want to tell practitioners? Well, going way back almost 20 years, there was a project called Envision Central Texas. Most cool. of you probably don't know that. Long um, ago. <laughs> and, uh, and John Freganese and, and I worked on that back in 2000. He recently passed away. It's very sad. But the, the, the concept behind Envision Central Texas, which was never really embraced, was that there would be multiple centers of gravity. And so that, that pattern, I think, is one that we're going perforce um, back into. And we haven't been there yet, but we're seeing it. And in that sense, Mueller, which I did work on, was the first of those, in a way. And it had nowhere near the commercial absorption that, by intent that the domain has, but it, it, it was the first second downtown. downtown. This is really, in, in some senses, the third second downtown. Does that <laughs> not make sense? <laughs> Um, so, uh, so that pattern, I think, will continue. And there was an ABJ article that was, came out recently that explored some of those. So I, I think what we need to look for from, uh, um, from that real estate perspective is understanding where those alternate downtowns, those alternate centers of gravity are going to be, because I think that's where the real opportunity is going to be, too. Got it. Thanks so much. Um, well, we want you guys to know that the Austin Board of Realtors feels like it's our responsibility to bring you up to speed on where those centers of gravity are going to be, what's happening on the ground. This program is an example of how we're trying to bring that conversation to you in a way that makes it digestible and accessible for you and your clients. So we hope that that has been helpful today. Thank you.